I was filming civilian evacuation today around Kurikove. I was also filming some assault squads, part of the 59th. If you're interested in exactly what battalion, it was this battalion right here. There's their patch. It's very cool. It's a bear. Uh, they're actually made up of former prisoner soldiers. I mean, former, former prisoner soldiers. They're former prisoners who have accepted a contract with the Ministry of Defense now that the manpower situation has gotten pretty bad uh, in order to, after like a year of fighting, and I mean hard fighting, I mean you're going to be doing assaults after assaults after assaults, and I'm not saying they're being used like meat or anything, what I'm saying is they're going to be fighting on the hardest part of the front, they're going to be getting no vacation time, and this is all stipulated in the contract, and they're going to be, you know, engaging in assaults, they're assault groups, they're like, they're used as fire groups to keep the Russians under pressure. And so I was talking to, to these guys about the fight for Pokrovsk, and they were recently in uh, Silodove, the Silodove, which is a location that the Russians just captured right here. And while inside the city, there was a Karadog, which is like very professional, very good troops. Uh, on the flanks of the Silodove, uh, there were not as professional troops, not everywhere. There were some, but uh, there were non, there were some troops that were not as professional. And when the Russians pressed them, uh, they broke and they were able to take Soldove, not because the troops in Soldove were weak or, you know, not wanting to fight. It was just simply that it was pushed from three sides because the flanks collapsed because they didn't have the manpower. And to make a good point, the experienced, motivated and well-supplied manpower in order to hold the flanks. And so the flanks collapsed, which then led to the city's collapse. And when I was talking to these guys about the problems they were facing and what issues were leading to the, you know, the, the pushing back of all this territory as of recent, because it's not just Sodove, even though that's what I was talking to them about. And they were telling me stories about, you know, soldiers stuck in coal mines that had to evacuate uh, through the mine shafts in order to get out because they were just surrounded on all sides. The Russian flooded in, but you could also look down in the south where the Russians have been making scary and I do mean, and I don't mean to under, uh, un, like, I don't want to underemphasize this, scary advances very quickly. Um, if you look here, look how much they've crossed and just like, let's start from here, from, from the 22nd of this month. So we're talking eight days ago. That is not what it was like before. That is not normal. That is very bad. And there's no way to sugarcoat it, sugarcoat it. There's no way to like beat around the bush. That is almost like it's not like shock mechanized warfare but it is much faster than what the russians were doing in 2023 and it is much faster than what the russians were doing earlier in the year and it really feels like a buzzer beater in a way because you know winter is coming very fast it's going to be november very soon and then as december comes around it's going to get cold and i was out there and Sumi with air defense teams a few days ago when it was cold and it was cold, cold. And it's and that was in October and fall. And so winter, it's going to be really bad. Uh, and so the winter is expected to slow down operations as it has done in the past. That doesn't mean it's going to re remove all pressure. Um, but the mud and the difficulty in building fort of, you know, digging, you know, digging with a shovel because of how tough the dirt is. You're going to need engineering equipment. And just the general weather, weather conditions is going to make it much harder for you to do uh, offensive operations, um, especially if you're going to be doing them at scale. So it feels like to me that what's happening is the Russians are putting on as much pressure as possible, not only on this front, but also we're hearing about pressure down in south. We're hearing about reports of possible pressure towards Orihiv. Um, how much that will develop, I do not know if it will develop to anything serious. We all know about the situation around um, Kupiansk and that it is very, very dangerous. As you can see right here, they're fighting to cut off Kupiansk from the south, uh, which is one of the locations that were taken back during the Ukrainian counteroffensives. It's under pressure from the north as well. Um, the city that was fought for hard, and we interviewed some of the people who fought for that city, including Kraken, on our main channel, which you can go check out one of those interviews from uh, a year, a year and a half ago. I don't know how long it's been. Uh, but the Russians are pushing uh, just about everywhere they can push of influence. 
And we've talked about this six or seven days ago, but now with the rapid advances in the South, and I'm going to call them rapid relative to what was happening in March, April of this year, for example, uh, not rapid in comparison to like, I don't know, the invasion of Kuwait um, and the loss of Sildove. Um, I, I felt like I needed to give this some attention because I think the situation is critical because the factors that they were telling me about uh, were the above. Number one, uh, poor ammunition supplies for a lot of the troops on the ground. While their unit specifically did not have any complaints about ammunition, uh, they did ask for more drone jamming equipment because all they have right now is shotguns to try to shoot down the drones. Uh, a lot of units have, of course, an ammunition disparity, which has already been heavily covered. Um, another issue that they talked about is communication problems that units are not necessarily communicating with each other and while they were fighting for the city they were unable to communicate with troops inside the city and it made it a lot harder for them because every unit is flanked by other units and if you're not able to talk to those units as you're under pressure when they could be giving you you know supportive fire and suppressing fire on the enemy that's assaulting your position or putting you under pressure now now you don't have that asset and i remember talking about this before on the channel when it had to do with Wagner and, Merc and mercenaries and the Chechens and the Ministry of Defense and their units clashing and not communicating and that hurting the Russians, that is not just a Russian issue. I mean, the clashing is not necessarily the thing that's a, the problem here, um, but just the lack of good communication. Uh, there's also a problem with uh, inexperienced commanders. That was a problem that was expressed to me by soldiers in the unit, and I interviewed the a battalion commander, I interviewed uh, a company commander, and I interviewed a rank and file soldier who was injured uh, three times, including on in assaults and other work uh, on positions. And they showed us the video of them under fire. So um, these are people who have been really fighting to hold Pokrovsk and have only been fighting in the Donetsk region. So I really, I do give them their words some credibility. Um, so there was a problem with poor communication, uh, inexperienced command, uh, uh, ammunition deficit and supply deficit uh, for a lot of the units in this area. And on top of all of that, on top of the supply deficit, on top of the good command deficit, on top of the uh, up to, uh, on top of uh, all these issues that they're facing, uh, there's also the fact that uh, sorry man, I'm tired, tired. Uh, just to emphasize how much I want to talk about this, I, again, I've been working for like 9, 10 hours straight, then we got back, I did more work. What was the other thing they complained about? It was ammunition, it was command, it was communication, and there was one more that was mentioned. There was one more that was mentioned. Command, communication, ammunition, command, communication, ammunition, uh, oh, and the manpower. A lot of the new recruits that are being brought to hold the flanks are not necessarily the most experienced troops. They are troops who have been conscripted off of a bus or out of a party, and they don't want to fight. They don't really want to be there. And they've been basically forced into service by conscription officers that are widely hated now in Ukrainian society. And I'm saying that as somebody who knows some of these conscription officers, and they're not all bad guys. A lot of them see what they're doing as necessary for the defense of their country. They have their families in these cities, and they want these cities to not be bombed because they don't want their families to, you know, be hurt. And so, you know, they're not all monsters, but a lot of them can behave in monstrous ways at times and how they're engaging in conscription efforts. Uh, uh, not to say that, like, they're all that way, but, I mean, they have built a very bad reputation. Um, and these soldiers that are taken out of the buses and taken out of these places, they don't want to fight. They don't have experience. Uh, they're put under pressure. And uh, they break in comparison to the other units, like the 47th. Or, I, don't, I mean, like the 59th, who have more experience and have been around for a bit now and have seen some things and know what they're doing. Um, so these are the problems that they're facing and led to the fall of Soldove. But this is not just a Soldove problem. This is a problem over here 
and it's probably going to lead to the lot of loss of Korinka. Uh, uh, sorry, Korivka. I'm sorry, I'm very tired. It's probably going to lead to the loss of a, a lot more southern uh, Donetsk villages as the south of Donetsk is put under immense pressure. All of these villages here, and I'm just being blunt, they're probably going to fall. I don't know when they're going to fall, but they're going to fall probably in the near future. Kurakove, uh, the Russians have reached the outskirts of. Uh, I was with an evacuation crew today when the Russians reached the outskirts of Kurakove. And, um, you know, they, they learned about it on Telegram. Nobody seemed very excited about it. And most of the people that we were seeing that were being evacuated as of this week were from Kurakove or Pokrovs, but the people we met today were from Kurakove. And they, and this woman, this elderly woman I was talking to, must have been in her 80s, um, but was keeping a good spirit about her. She told me how she had to repair her house five times because of the bombing. But then eventually after her neighbor's house got hit for the bajillionth time, she decided it was finally time to go because it's gotten just too bad and as you can see the russians are now entering the outskirts of Kurakove, so her judgment might i think is quite accurate so the situation right now in the donetsk region is critical and these the problems that we're talking about here is not just problems that are again a problem in the donetsk region uh while of course different areas have different local problems different issues it's a problem that is shown in some shape or form in other areas of the front why do we have these problems? Uh, well, now, some of these are just due to domestic issues that the Ukrainians have not been able to deal with. Uh, when it comes to poor command and poor training of command, uh, that's a problem with uh, the training of these new commanders. That's a problem of the skill of these commanders. And that is the fault of the Ukrainian uh, military academies, you could say, or the officer training schools, or any number of things you could point to. When he talks to uh, talk about uh, poor communication, uh, this is a problem with command and control. This is a problem with uh, having clear and concise and fast communication between units that has affected both sides. And but we're like three years in now, and there's really no good excuse at this point for bad communication like that. Um, this is also the fault of, and this hasn't been mentioned yet, but poor fortifications. After Volodar fell, there was nothing stopping the Russian advance. The, there was nothing behind Volodar. And they had like two to three years to build defenses behind Volodar. And they didn't. And so now the villages behind Volodar have been crushed. They've been conquered. And uh, you're only going to see more. You can see it's like they've traveled like seven kilometers since Volodar fell. You can see they've pushed here and they're only going to push further. further. So uh, a, a big issue though, and this is something I got to put front and center because this has to do with the United States. And while I could point at the manpower proposal that Zelensky just put out, which is 133,000 soldiers so they can get to 85% readiness, we could talk about the feasibility of that, the quality the soldiers are going to bring in, how much training they're going to get. I know the French just announced they're going to be training new units as well. Um, more for, whether more foreign training programs can help. Uh, I want to talk about the factor that you know we can have an impact on quickly, uh, and that is uh, supply. Uh, and we need to deal with this uh, before the next president is sworn into office, in my mind. Um, we do not have time to wait because the next president will be sworn into office in January of next year. And these villages are falling now. And you need to send stuff and get stuff approved months in advance. Uh, when we had the 10 months delay of aid to Ukraine because immigration policy got tied up with foreign policy in a very silly way that went nowhere, wasted time and wasted lives. Uh, when it eventually was approved and everybody was patting themselves on the bat, Evdivka was falling. It was, it was going down. Like so many people had already died. And since, and after, you know, it's approved, it still takes time to put those shells and those weapons into boats, into transport ships, send them over the sea, put them on the planes, fly them over, get them to Poland, then put them on the rail line, then flow it over to Lviv, then take it from Lviv to Kiev, then take it to Kiev, to Kramatorsk or Slovyansk or wherever else, then disperse it in the smaller vehicles because you don't want to be struck and lose all your new gear. And then as you're dispersing it, then you send it to the local supply depots. And then from the supply depots, it goes to the frontline positions. That takes time. 
And so even if we were to have Biden announce today, like we're going to be set, we're going to be spending every ounce of aid and here's my package after package after package. And I've negotiated somehow with the Republican opposition, uh, a deal to have uh, to pass aid before the next president or whatever, even if they were to do that, it would still take immense amounts of time to get there time. And I'm calling it immense because it's immense relative to the damage that is being done now and the need of that aid there, because this, in my mind, trickles down to all other issues. And of course, we're not the center of all of Ukraine's issues with its military. Uh, its conscription issue was beat, beat, they beat around the bush for a while for political re reasons, and that delayed conscription, which delayed manpower that was necessary on the front, which has had an impact. Uh, there's, you know, the same issues with the corruption that has been covered a million times before. Like we've already talked about communication, uh, poor command. But when we talk about supply, this trickles down to everything. Not only like have more shells, blow up more Russians, like that's a pretty basic one to one, right? Have more tanks, can hold position better, have more uh, uh, engineering equipment. And this is a big thing. I mean, you throw 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars into engineering equipment. It makes up the the cost immediately 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 because that engineered equipment is needed it's needed now and it can help dig trenches which saves lives and has trickle down effects all the way and that's why like people like um uh gosh i'm trying to remember it's not project constantine is it i think it's constant yes no it is constantine um I, that's why i believe constantine is like fundraising for engineering equipment right now um that has that immediate battlefield impact. But if you are a draft dodger, if you are somebody who doesn't want to be recruited into the Ukrainian armed forces, and I've talked to quite a few, uh, either at parties or at other places where I'm like hanging out between embeds, and they'll express to me, well, some will say, you know, war is like, a, you know, it's a big scam and, you know, peace on earth. And they'll just, or, or they're just like, I'm scared. I'll never fight. I never want to hold a gun. Screw that. A lot of them, in fact, I would say the majority of them, of course, this is my own personal experience. This is not a poll. But in my experience, their problem with joining isn't that they don't want to defend their country. Their cities have been getting bombed for almost like three years nonstop. They've had they've heard these Shahid drones going over their apartment again and again and again, going over their village homes. And every time it just gets that much closer, you wonder if it's going to be this time for you. You know, and then they get angry about that. And when I was talking to the prisoner soldiers today about their motivations for fighting as in former convicts who are in the armed forces, uh, like they, they were talking to me. I was expecting, oh, I did this for, you know, freedom because you get you do a year of hard service and then you get out. Right. But this 20 year old guy, he was like, uh, it's for my daughter. And I'm like, oh, you want to visit your daughter? And that was part of it. He was like, no, no, no. I want to defend this land because I don't want what happened everywhere else to happen to my daughter and her home and to the rest of my family. And that answer to me was not what I expected. Not that these people don't have families. I just expected leaning more into the freedom angle, but he barely talked about the fact that him fighting would actually get him out of prison. I'm sure he wants to go see his daughter, but it would seem to be much more about Defending, I think it's both, of course, but much more about defending. Actually, I think I should bring up a quickie video of this. One second. Do, 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 do. Here's the boys we were with. I, I was with them going to the assault. <laughs> anyway, these are people, many of whom would be more than willing to fight for their homes, but they're not going to do it in de degraded BMP ones that if you like kick it the wrong way, it's going to explode and kill six guys. They don't want to do it without anti drone gear because the main losses from the people I was talking with today is to FPVs. And even like the most optimistic guys, if you ask them what they need, they're going to tell you what they need. There's never like, Oh, we have no problems whatsoever and need nothing. And everything's great. They've never, I've never gotten that response from anyone. Uh, these people, a lot of them want to fight a lot of the draft dodgers and other people who are doing everything they can to avoid service would otherwise be maybe even willing to fight if called upon, if not energetic about it, if they thought they were going to have good gear, they're going to have good command and et cetera. And the gear part is really essential because 
The guy I was interviewing today who was injured three times, the only reason he's alive is because he was in a Turkish arm armored vehicle when the Russians bombed him. And there's video of it online somewhere. And when I publish the documentary, I'm, I'm going to put the footage in there. But they get hit a few times. And the dude gets out of it with a concussion. And while a concussion sucks, and that counts as an injury, uh, relatively speaking, that's pretty it's getting off pretty easy considering how hard they were hit and the reason they were alive was because they were in a good armored vehicle if they were in a bmp1 they'd be dead if they were in some lightly like armored mtlb they'd be dead hell even if they were in like a you know shipped over american 113 they'd be dead if they were in a lot of they were in some ural they would be dead and when you see so many videos where these FPVs hit cars, I look at it and I think if that was this car, if this was a uh, Bradley instead of a BMP, they'd probably still be alive because of the armor. If that was an Abrams instead of a Leopard 1, right, they'd probably still be alive, right? And when I think about their manpower issues, not only does that help when it comes to preserving manpower that they desperately need and experience, because if you've been, if you go out there in one of these tanks and you fight 10, 11, 12 battles, the more battles you fight, the more likely it is that, you know, you, you die that you, and then when they die, you don't only lose that person, that soul, that human being, you also lose the experience that they gained. So you're preserving manpower, you're preserving experience, and you're giving people uh, some confidence that they will have the tools necessary to survive. One of the big things that I really hope the Ukrainians do, and I hope the West can help them do it, is a revamping of their training programs. Because whether or not you get in a good unit, I think is largely dependent. It's not the main, the only thing, but I think it's largely dependent on you know quality of training. Um, because some units, they will have, they'll run, you know, they'll run around and they'll be in good shape and they'll you know, do training every day and they make, they try to get through everything and they're motivated and they're like, let's, let's go, let's go, let's go. Remember guys, we're doing that. And other guys, they're like smoking during, and they don't do any running. They're all kind of fat. And I'm not being mean. I'm just saying there's a lot of fat guys. There's people who are just not in shape. There's not really effort being put in. And the difference that that type of training can make can not only, it's not only going to manifest when you go out there and you, and you need to call upon that training to survive, but it has a mental impact. Because if you start doing these drills and you start shooting and you get more accurate and accurate and accurate, and you know what you're doing, you know how to apply the, you know, use a med kit and use a tourniquet and, and, and where you would need to, you know, check for uh, uh, bleeding first or something. If you know how to do all this stuff, the more you develop it, you start to get in the mentality of like, oh my God, we can actually do this. We can actually survive. When you're just lounging around doing some training here, some training there, and then you're thrown in a back of a pickup truck and that's the best you're going to get, it doesn't inspire the same amount of confidence. And so that doesn't only have an impact on the enlisted soldiers, uh, those conscripted or volunteered, but it, it also has an impact on those who could potentially join the armed forces. Those who are who've either... Uh, opted out of volunteering up to this point or have been conscripted and, or, and but have just dodged and if they've just stayed in their home and they've stayed away from the war because they do not want to be sent in some pickup truck by some fat uh, officer who went to officer school and knows what it looks like on paper but has no clue how to actually send out an assault or how to properly plan it and does not show the proper respect to soldiers. And I'm not saying that's what the majority of Ukrainian officers or commanders are like. I'm just saying that that has a reputation and the reputation comes from somewhere and uh, you can talk to soldiers yourself. Come yeah, come over here, guys. Come over here. Come over here and talk to the soldiers yourself uh, if you want to learn about it. Anyway, these are all problems that could potentially be addressed. They could potentially make tough decisions about mobilization to get the manpower they need. They could potentially revamp their training programs uh, with Western support in order to make it more NATO standard and uh, give to, not only give the soldiers the tools necessary to survive, but make them believe and know that they have the tools necessary to survive so they can call upon it once under fire and the muscle memory needs to kick in, right? We could, we could get 
you know, we can, these are all things, the ammunition and the, and the, you know, the lack of armored vehicles. These are all things that could potentially be solved, but they require action. And that action needs to be immediate because if it is not immediate, we're going to see more, I mean, more villages are going to fall. I'm just going to be blunt with you. Koreevo uh, is probably going to fall. I'm not saying it, I, I know 100%. I'm not a fortune teller, right? But it's probably going to fall. And it is the city that is the closest to Donetsk right now. So it's also pr pretty painful for the people who, you know, still dream of going back to their home as, as they see these pathways, these jumping off points that could be used to go back home narrow, narrow, narrow. These are all issues that could potentially be solved, but they need to be addressed immediately. The ammunition that Ukraine needs, they need it yesterday. They need large shipments of 155 millimeter shells. They don't need 20,000 here, 20,000 there. They need a million here, 1.5 million there. They don't need another $500 million aid package. They need another $20 billion aid package. They need another $30 billion aid package. Uh, and the United States is the only one that could provide that scale of like 30 billion. But the European Union could also still dig deeper into its stockpiles to give them the equipment necessary to try to keep holding the line, keep holding the line and giving the Russians maximum attrition. Because right now the Russians, while what we've been talking about so far is dooming, much of the issues we've talked about, if not all of them, except for the ammunition disparity, um, applies to the Russians as well. It all, it all applies to the Russians as well, including the manpower problem. Doing these constant assaults takes its toll. And while the Ukrainians have been taking some pretty devastating losses, the Russians have been taking some otherworldly losses. In fact, they have been, I think they just had the second highest casualty rate in a single day. Uh, uh, recently, they, they hit that record, the second highest. Now, that means like 1,500 to 1,700 soldiers in a day being either injured or killed. It, it, that... Uh, over a thousand in and of itself is crazy, but the fact that you're on the pathway to 2,000 is mind-numbingly crazy. Now, of course, these are Ukrainian numbers, but I, me and others do are led to believe that they're based off of something, and even if not every single number is necessarily accurate, if even 80% or 70% is accurate, still devastating losses, still devastating losses. But these problems that they could make worse for the Russians, the attrition problems can only be made worse for the Russians to halt their advance if they have the tools necessary to push them back. So where is the West? Where is the Western action? Where is the Ukrainian domestic reforms assisted by Western action? Well, let's talk a little bit about an escalation that was done by Russia, by Russia, that has gotten very little response so far. So for those of you who don't know, North Korean soldiers are probably in the Kursk region. Uh, there's reports that it could be 3,000. Uh, we already know from multiple intelligence agencies, we know from the United States, we know from the United Kingdom, we know from South Korea, we know from Ukraine, we know from others, that North Korean soldiers are in Ukraine. And we got satellite photos to prove it. There's satellite photos of it. It's not, I mean, they're not, I mean, not in Ukraine, in Russia. We've got satellite photos to prove it. And now we have a good reason to believe that they're probably in Kursk. Now, if they're in Kursk and they start assaulting Ukrainian positions, that means more manpower and possibly a continued stream of manpower. If they take a thousand losses, could be replaced by a thousand more men from North Korea. That adds more pressure. It is another country not formally entering the war through public announcement, but entering the war. And so far... The counteraction from the West has been um, nothing. Uh, we have yet to see any uh, large-scale uh, coordinated response in trying to get more support to Ukraine or anything that's in direct response to this. In fact, uh, I saw Biden say in the last 24 hours, and when I read this, I wrote, I, oof, <laughs> that said, Wow. Uh, you know, if if the North, it was journalist question. It was like, if what 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 are you going to what should should Ukraine strike these these North Korean soldiers? What should should we lift these restrictions to do this? Should we do that? And Biden said, if the North Korean soldiers enter Ukraine, then Ukraine should bomb them. The, if they're fighting Ukraine and Kursk, that's another country entering the war on the side of Russia. 
North Korean missiles are already free range to hit anywhere in Ukraine. Uh, we have good reason to believe that a plurality, if not a majority, of Russian shells that are being fired at Ukraine come from North Korean ammunition factories and storage facilities. And now their soldiers are fighting in the war, fighting, uh, or soon to be fighting in the war, at least believed to be, have, with heavy evidence. And the response is, well, if they move into, uh, into Donetsk, then do something. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of when Lloyd Austin was worrying about, Secretary of, of Defense Lloyd Austin, uh, of these Russian soldiers building up in the Kharkiv area, and there was, you know, questions of what should be done, and then they invade into Volchansk, and then after they invade into Volchansk, long-range strikes is approved because the Russians were keeping their artillery right over the border and just bombing into Ukraine. It was like, well, it would probably been better if we could have, if they could have struck the soldiers as they were gathering up, and... and it, it, but it's too late now, Volchansk is rubble. Uh, basically, all of the buildings of Volchansk have been either heavily damaged or completely destroyed. So that's all history. It's only a question of what you can do going into the future. And now, North Korean soldiers are going to Kursk. And the response is, well, if they go into Ukraine, then maybe... Why is there not a statement of, if they do this, there will be a response, it will be coordinated, and it will be painful? I understand that it's not like they can go bomb North Korea or there's not like a package of sanctions they can go introduce because we've already introduced every sanction, but there has to be something. There has to be something. It cannot just be we always talk about us escalating and then the Russians escalate and then we're like, oh, oh, oh. And it seems like they're acknowledging it's an escalation. Western leaders in Europe are acknowledging it's an escalation. Uh, I've seen American officials, I believe Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin acknowledged that it's an escalation. And like, I forgive you used the word dangerous or what exact word he used, but he wasn't excited about it. But if they escalate and we do not match them or do something in response to counter that, what message does that send? Not only does it send a message of like, how well, really, how dedicated are we? But it also means, well, if they can take one step, why can't they take another? And one big response that I talked about, and I thought made perfect sense, because we've already done this before, we already did it before, it was useful then, it could be useful now, is the introduction of South Korean ammunition production on the side of the Ukrainians. So, back in 2023, South Korea shipped 500,000 artillery shells to Ukraine. Now... If you read, you know, uh, South Korean government reports, it's not exactly what happened because to them, technically, they shipped 500,000 shells to the United States. And then the United States shipped 500,000 shells to Ukraine. And the reason this is, is because in South Korea, there is a law where uh, you cannot ship weapons directly to an active war zone. Uh, why you would make a law so that you can't send weapons to where they would presumably be most needed in a time of crisis. Um, I don't know. Go take that up with the South Koreans, I guess. But that's the law. So what they did is they sent it indirectly through the United States. And one response that was being talked about uh, is that after this, after North Korea has now sending, already has like engineers on the ground firing North Korean missiles into Ukraine, tons of artillery. I mean, it's an artillery war. There's really almost nothing more valuable aid-wise that you could provide either side besides artillery, and that is what North Korea is providing them. And now they're providing soldiers. South Korea knows it's, they're probably going to gain experience, experience that they can transition back home. And North Korea is developing a military relationship with Russia that allows them to, the, the uh, North Koreans, to leverage that relationship to get more assistance and technology sharing and otherwise that they can then turn on the, North, uh, on the South Koreans. For example, missile targeting technology to make their missiles more accurate or faster, etc. And so there, there is a, 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 there is a, a, a security implication for South Korea here. And so this possibility of shifting this policy to make it you can directly ship, ship artillery shells was one question or one idea that was being talked about. Uh, now, I said that at the time that it was unlikely, but I was still a little bit hopeful, but it was unlikely. And the reason why is that uh, the current president of, of South Korea 
is uh, not super popular right now, and he does not have a very well-functioning legislative majority. And the Republican Republic of Korea's opposition is not very hyped about him, uh, and they're not very hi- and some of a lot of them are not very hyped about the idea of getting more involved in the war. Um, in fact, the Democratic Party and I know as an American, you know, that has connotations, but they're a liberal party in South Korea. Uh, They're criticizing the government for the possibility of them sending, uh, you know, some interrogators to Ukraine to interrogate possibly captured North Korean POWs in Ukraine. What a sentence in the 21st century that is, right? Uh, And they were getting, they were critiquing him. Let me read you some of this, actually. Um. This is honestly, some of this is silly from the opposition. It doesn't, it makes no fucking sense. It seems they're trying to quietly send military personnel without parliamentary consent, Lee claimed, citing an exclusive Hancock Libo report that said the National Intelligence Service will talk to Ukraine about possibly sending experts to assist the interrogation of North Korean prisoners of war. How cruel would these acts be? Why would an official South Korean institution participate in interrogating prisoners of war from another country's conflict? Do they want to be misunderstood as teaching torture techniques to the world? What? What is this, what is this nonsense? Like, it's one thing, the first part made sense. Oh, parliamentary consent, you know, further entanglement uh, as, and, you know, it could push the Russians and the North Koreans closer together. I'm of the belief that they're already pushed tremendously close together. They've got a military alliance now. They're helping them with sanctions evasion and technology sharing. That's already going to, like, I, mm. but to- they're going to make people think of torture. Like the Russians, according to the UN, okay, don't take my word for it. Listen to the United Nations. And let me tell you something. The Ukrainians don't have a huge um, appreciation for the United Nations right now. They say that torture within the Russian uh, POW places, as in, you know, where they keep their POWs, that torture is systematic, sexual violence, uh, horrible abuses towards these soldiers. You you just talk about sending over interrogators and you're going to like, whatever. Okay, you get the idea. I think it's a silly response. But it doesn't look like South Korea is going to be sending, sending uh, direct provisions of military assistance to Ukraine. Or even like sales of weapons to Ukraine, even though they're, I believe, the fourth largest weapons manufacturer in the world and one of the largest producers of 155 millimeter artillery shells, which is one of the exact artillery shells the Ukraine needs right, right now. Now, this right here made me pretty doomer. This made me pretty doomer. Now, there is a silver lining here. There's a silver lining in this for response to what's happening right now with the North Korean escalation in the midst of an extremely critical situation on the front line right now as the Russians make some pretty uh, scary advances, and I can't call anything else but that, uh, in southern uh, Donetsk. Uh, One silver lining is that they could still technically do the same thing they did before. They could send another 500,000 shells, or maybe this time a million shells, and right now would be the time to do it, uh, through the United States over to Ukraine. And Biden could be the one to try to go over to them, pressure them to do it, try to move with them to do it, because if the South Koreans could do it then, there's no reason they could not technically do it again. And if they are worried about escalating the conflict on their side of the aisle, it could be as simple as, well, you know, publicly making statements or hinting at the idea that, you know, the less involved North Korea is, the less involved they will be. Or if North Korea does not escalate further, then, you know, they will not escalate further. There's other ways they can go about it. But point is, sending this aid to indirectly through the United States is a pathway they could still get there while keeping in line with this policy that the presidential office has announced. Whether that will happen is another story. I have no clue if that's actually going to end up happening. Oh, here is the quote from Lloyd Austin. Dangerous and destabilizing. Destabilizing. Strong language, as always. Uh, And by the way, at the same time that this is all going on, parts of Zelensky's victory plan was leaked. Zelensky requested in private from the United States access to Tomahawk missiles to hit the Russians. Now, 
much of, I think about three sections of the Ukraine peace plan. There was eight sections, five bullet points that were publicly announced and three points that were not publicly announced. Um, and parts of those areas that were not publicly announced were weapons requests, because if Ukraine got those weapons and then, uh, you know, they were kept secret, then they could use it to surprise the Russians on the battlefield with a, capa with a capability that they did not have before or with a sudden increase in like a different type of weapon, but that serves the same purpose as something else. For example, like a, like another Gimler's like rocket that could be used. That, so they have now a, a, an increased supply that they didn't have before. Uh, they want to keep that secret for that reason, and it got leaked. And it got leaked. And it's... Not only is that bad, because we already had the Jack Textera leak, which was not only a leak, it was an embarrassing leak, a silly leak, where a National Guardsman went to a Discord channel and to impress his internet homies on the Thug Shaker Discord channel, decided to start leaking classified documents, and they got out to the public. This is something that undermines confidence in our relationship. And it can undermine their national security in the moment like this. And this is like the easy stuff. This is the just keep your mouth shut stuff. And so Zelensky's pissed about it. Let me let me read you Zelensky's quote. Ukraine's request for Tomahawk missiles was confidential information between partners. President Vladimir Zelensky complained on October 30th after a leak in the U.S. media. The New York Times reported on October 29th that according to undisclosed U.S. officials, the request for Tomahawk missiles with a range of 2,400 kilometers, 1,500 miles, was part of a secretive non-nuclear deterrence package included in Ukraine's victory plan. The sources told the outlet that Washington was unconvinced that Ukraine needed the weaponry and was reluctant to supply them due to their limited numbers. It was confidential information between Ukraine and the White House. How to understand these messages, Zelensky said during a press briefing with journalists from Nordic countries. So this means that partners, that between partners, there is no confidentiality. Let me say that again. This means that between partners, there is no confidentiality. I said that this is a preventative method. I was told that it is an escalation. <laughs> an escalation. Now, to be clear, Ukraine could already hit that deep into Russia. They can just hit it with drones. And yes, it would be an escalation. But what do you do when one side escalates? If you just stay in place, you stay still while they shuffle around, they're going to outflank you. And it doesn't have to be this type of escalation. It could be, okay, we're going to ship all these artillery shells, but you have to do something the status quo is not sustainable. And even if you're one of the most cynical rats out there and you're just thinking about this purely as well, let's just stop Ukraine from collapsing. Let's not end the war. Let's not try to push for victory. Let's just kind of, let's just kind of leave it where it is. Cause you know, it kind of, you know, it doesn't really hurt us that much. It hurts the Russians more. If that, if that's what you're about, they're losing positions. They're not holding the line. The, the, the Sadovi shouldn't have fallen. Avdivka shouldn't have fallen. There's so many of these places that if they had the ammunition, if they had the supplies, they could have kept it. But they didn't. But they didn't. And right now, we have a situation where the North Koreans are escalating their involvement into the war after escalating on the artillery front, the missile front, and now the troop front. And we have the fourth largest weapons manufacturer right there producing the exact ammunition we need that we are in short supply of. And we have no idea about the pathway from point A to point B. We have no idea about the pathway from point A to point B. And that is disastrous. We need immediate action. We need immediate shipments. We need immediate support if your aim is for Ukraine not only to win the war, but to stop the bleeding of lives and territory that as the longer it goes on, the harder it's going to be. The more you bleed, the more likely it is you're going to bleed out. And the Russian strategy for victory is push, push, push. And when you push, you'll find somewhere that's weak. And when you find somewhere that's weak, you hit it with everything you have. And so far, that's led to small breakthroughs that they haven't been able to turn into strategic, really big strategic gains. So far, it's been local tactical gains, right? 
uh, that are being built upon one on the other that through time could become strategic gains. But if it gets to a point where it's a bunch of territorial defense battalions full of people who were taken off of shuttle buses on their ways to work and are being sent to the front now uh, with piss poor equipment and piss poor armor and they don't have the ammunition that they need and they don't have the well the good training that they should be getting don't be surprised if the russian strategy for victory even if it is extremely self-damaging and is as if they're pulling the spear that they've impaled themselves with deeper and deeper under the it's almost like the uh uh goku raditz i can't believe making an anime comparison like goku raditz strategy is extremely self-destructive you just hold them down you take me but i'll take you down with you there's two of us there's one of you and while that's very self-destructive if they can make the front line buckle and they don't have the reserves which they don't then you can have a situation where it does become a strategic breakthrough and now we're not talking about the fall of Pokrovsk. We're talking about the complete fall of the Donetsk region. We're talking about the Ukrainians being pushed out of the entirety of the Donbass. Not because, you know, the, the West doesn't have the capacity to support them, but because the West chooses not to. Chooses not to. I hear about ammunition constraints. For example, we do not want to send enough ammunition that it damages American military readiness. Now, number one... If that military readiness has to do with Europe, I would say the further damaged the Russians are, the less ammunition you would actually need in Europe because it's not the Poles that are going to invade Berlin. There's only one major power in Europe that is a major threat to the Western NATO-aligned structure, and it is the one that it is still alive to defend against, and that is the Russians. And so if you are lowering your European military readiness to damage your one threat in the region, I would say, you know, it kind of balances it out in the long run, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And if it was a temporary reduction in military readiness to have long-term strategic benefit benefits, so you don't even need to have the gigantic military investments that would follow a kind of stalemated, frozen conflict in Europe as all of Europe prepares for a war to reignite, which would be highly likely, not 100% guaranteed, but sad to say, highly likely, highly likely. Point is, it's a priority, and I think the government needs to treat it like it's a priority. I think the government needs to find some way to get the South Koreans to send those artillery shells, even if it needs to be more of the carrot than the stick approach. Uh, because the situation is critical, and the situation as right now, uh, is being held together uh, by everybody that is on the front. But if we have a major breakthrough, I fear that there's not a lot of reserves that the Ukrainians could pull upon to try to punch that breakthrough back. And it's again, if you pull up to Kursk, you can see that the Russians have pushed and taken about like 300, uh, uh, 300 square miles back of territory nearly half of what the Ukrainians have taken uh, in the Kursk region. Uh, so the damage that they're doing here to the Ukrainians, even if the Ukrainians are still doing more, you know what, it has an impact. It's having an impact here, it's having an imp impact in Kharkiv, it's having an impact Occur everywhere. Is occurred. North Korean soldiers are fighting in Europe in Year of Our Lord 2024. Despise how the West has maintained this farce that's it's all chill while these brave men fight off a modern imperial conquest. Thank you for the 10, I appreciate it. Yeah, um, North Korean soldiers are invading Europe, and what's the response? That, that's, that's my ending question. North Korean soldiers are invading Europe. What's the response? What's the response? What's the response? What's the response? And I mean, like, and let's be clear, it's not like the Russians are like pulling back any of their behavior. We're getting tons of reports of POW executions. We, I mean, there was a bombing of Kharkiv uh, in the last 24 hours that's that's making casualties out of like 11 year old girls. Uh, there's experimental bombs that are being dropped on the city as the Russians find new destructive ways. Look at this thing. 
Look at this new experimental bomb that they dropped, the Grom E1 on Kharkiv and the damage that did. One missile to this civilian infrastructure. They're not, they're not pulling back their bombing the civilian infrastructure. They're not pulling back POW executions. They're not pulling back their torture regime. They're not pulling back their targeting of civilians and the human safari in Kherson. Google it if you don't know about it. So they're advancing. They're as brutal as there was before. And I think a lot of it might just be from the, the lack of public pressure from the horror of the these initial atrocities wearing off, decreased public attention due to international affairs, and honestly, uh, maybe just like the, the gears and Western thinking rusting. I, I, I'm trying to find some explanation. I, I understand that the, the idea of reducing military readiness being something that's uncomfortable. I, I understand the, the fear of new, you know, atomic weapons blowing up the world, making you fearful of escalation, especially as an 82 year old foreign policy veteran as Joe Biden is. But you should be equally as fearful about losing this war. We should be equally as fearful about uh, about not only losing the war, but even the war stalemating. Stalemating and then having to reignite later. Uh, because if the Russians uh, take Donetsk and take Luhansk and take back Kherson and take all these places that they want to push for, and they continue to talk about pushing for, uh, the reward is not going to be, okay, the violence is at least over. Or even if we just freeze the lines as they are and the Russians can sell to the public that this is a success and they buy it. Even if you try to placate yourself for the idea with the war is over. Is that the signal that has been sent to the domestic Russian public? What, what do you think America's next step would be if the impression everybody took from the war in Iraq was that it was a good idea, it was successful, and it was good policy? Do you think America might do more wars in Iraq? Maybe not Iraq, but maybe troops on the ground in Yemen. Maybe a John Bolton leads an invasion of Iran. If the Russian public and the Russian government can justify an action like this, why not build upon it in a country like Moldova, which just barely voted to join the European Union after mass allegations of voter uh, fraud? From the Russians, as in they would, they were buying votes, voter fraud, as in vote buying, with the upper echelons of that number being 300,000, and 300,000 votes in a tight race, in a country of like over 5 million people, that's a lot of votes, that is a lot of votes to buy that they're accused of, and now we're seeing what's going on in Georgia. I don't even want to get into that right now, I did a video on it on my second channel if you want to check it out. What if they follow this up with an invasion of Moldova, if... You know, the West wouldn't defend Ukraine. Why would they defend this much smaller country that we already have troops also illegally stationed in to protect Russian speakers, by the way? You're going to hear that a lot from the Russians in the next few years. Protect Russian speakers here, respect Russian speakers there. Hey, there's Russian speakers everywhere because Russia's the largest country on the fucking planet. Anyway, Russian speakers everywhere. And protect them, of course, by blowing up their homes. Um, point is... If they can justify this war to themselves and they think it was the right move and they are rewarded for it, why would they stop the action? Why would they stop? How do you fall face first like the Russians the did at the start? Western democracy is in retreat because it is undergoing an identity crisis. Until we as the West embrace democracy. Until uh, we as the West embrace democracy and fight against cynics who want to destroy it, things will get worse. Thank you so much for the $10. We do need to fight against the anti-democratic cynics. When Tucker Carlson goes to Russia and he says democracy doesn't really matter all that much because look how low the grocery store prices are in a country with a much lower cost of living, which still makes up a very significant chunk of a Russian's income. That should be met with vile outrage by both sides of the political spectrum. And that's another thing. You want to know what is a real problem here? Where are the Republican hawks? Where are the Republican uh, elephants that wanted to stomp across the world in the name of the red, white, and blue when it comes to this war? Occurred. The thing is, occurred. I'm not a fan of John Bolton. Stay safe, Dylan. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Corey. I'm not a fan of John Bolton. He's not my guy, Okay. But I know that if Biden gets a little soft on an issue he shouldn't, like, for example, the Russians, 
which he was very soft on, then John Bolton will be there to pull him in the other direction PR-wise or public-wise. Not just John Bolton, but the entirety of the Republican Party because they're going to criticize him, they're going to slam him, and he has to be on his toes. He doesn't have... He's not given the leniency. They're, the Republicans have given Joe Biden all the leniency. And if anything, the the majority or a large plurality have been pulling them in the other direction. And Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, has openly admitted that there's no problem within the Democratic Party on aid to Ukraine. They're all on board. It was the Republican Party that delayed it for 10 months. And when you're Joe Biden and you're a hesitant 82-year-old man with foreign policy experience, unlikely to take the risks that might be necessary in order to achieve a foreign policy victory, what would sometimes push him to might be something like the opposition slamming him for it in an election year. Could you imagine how different this election would be if we were hearing from the main Republican candidate? Oh my gosh, my candidate who was watching mass graves filled get filled in Ukraine, who knows about the systematic torture, who sees civilian homes getting bombed, who sees children's cancer hospitals getting bombed. When Joe Biden said he wanted to abolish cancer in his first, during his term in office, while he's watching all this happen to a country that he and his, uh, that his former president, his former commander in chief, Barack Obama, oversaw the weapons destruction, the destruction of their weapons, He's not doing what's necessary to defend their skies. He's not doing what's necessary to defend their uh, their civilians. He's not giving them the long strike approval. He's not sending the shells. He's not working with our South Korean allies, yada, 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 yada. I'm not saying that all of that would change the war overnight or whatever. I'm not saying that all that would, you know, immediately push Biden in that direction or anything. I'm not even saying I would necessarily agree with all those critiques because I believe some of Biden's hesitancy has been warranted. Not all of it. I would not even say the majority of it, but some of it. Of course, I don't want to blow up an atomic hellfire, and I think it's good that we have a president that's worried about that. Instead of saying, Rocket Man, now, now all of a sudden Trump cares about the danger of atomic weapons when he was proposing nuking, whatever, I don't want to get into it. But when you have that pressure, it keeps him in check. There's no opposition to keep him in check because the opposition is talking about uh, like Ukraine. Like what is it? Marjorie Taylor Greene said that Ukraine's harvesting the organs of Ukrainian children in order to fund the war effort. It's just like delusion. It's just pure delusion and schizophrenia. Again, apologize to the schizophrenic community. I get the emails. OK, I just need to think of a better insult. That, that this war could have. I mean, the, not only the tempo and conversation around the war would be so different if it was, say, nominee Nikki Haley or whoever, maybe even like 2016 Marco Rubio, who did, whoever, than if it was Donald Trump as he is now. The same man who talks so much about showing strength uh, uh, and showing power now saying, well, just kind of give him everything. Man, it's not good. Man, it is not good. Uh, the bright side is, is that the election is in just a few days. We're going to have the election. And then after the election, hopefully there'll be some more wiggle room. We're still going to have to wait for a new Congress to be sworn in, a new Senate to be sworn in. But there's also the possibility, and I'm just being blunt here, that not only does that pressure not build back up from the Republican side, which I think is likely that it doesn't, that we're not going to see like a reversal once Trump loses and they're going to be like, well, now we're all in favor of Ukraine, Slava Ukraine or whatever. Um, even though it's, I think it's, I think it's going to be as flip floppy as ever. If we don't control the Senate and you have someone like Senator Ron Johnson or Senator J.D. Vance in a position of influence pushing the new Senate leader, that's not going to be Mitch McConnell, who was very in favor of aid to Ukraine. In fact, who wants to go further than uh, 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 probably the Biden administration does. Um, but it's somebody who is going to be more permissive to those requests. Then we could be in a situation where we take back the House. And now instead of Mike Johnson giving us trouble for Ukraine aid, we're going to have Republican Senate leader giving us problems with Ukraine aid, maybe not even because they particularly don't want to send aid to Ukraine. If you ask Mike Johnson about religious persecution of Baptists and Protestant Christians in Ukraine, you know, he he knows about it. He expresses his like distaste for it. I think there's some, per because he is a very religious man, and I do believe he believes it, I think there's some distaste there. But, you know, he is a political animal, and he is controlled 
uh, by Donald Trump top down at the end of the day. He led uh, the uh, effort to try to overturn the election results. He led the effort to take the results of a Democratic election and throw them into the trash. And so if he's willing to do that for Donald Trump, if Donald Trump, after this election, even a lost Donald Trump, especially if it's close, to, you know, continue to sabotage it, a I think he would. Is a now move that to the Senate. Move Formio that issue to the Senate. underscore has donated $50. Dylan, do the next broadcast wearing a bandana or balaclava. <laughs> balaclava. I'm not going to do the next uh, stream doing a balaclava. Bandana? Maybe. I, maybe I'd wear it around the neck because, like, I have, like, long hair, and I don't know. I mean, I guess it could make it work. Maybe. We'll see what happens. Thank you for the 50 bucks. Thank you for the 50 bucks. Ugh. Point is that even though we do have this, you know, we're going to, if Harris wins, and that's still a major if because it's neck and neck, and there's a real possibility that Trump wins, please go and vote especially if you're in a swing state, if you're in this chat today, if you're listening today. Um, uh, and if you haven't registered to vote, check if your state allows you to register to vote this late in, because there might be some that still do. Um, you never know. <sighs> Man. <sighs> if Harris wins, we're going to be on the other side of a very bumpy road that we've been on, but we're still going to have potentially the same problem just imported to the Senate on top of the fact that we really don't know how Harris is going to treat the war, do we? I mean, we hear what Harris says about it, and tomorrow we're going to be releasing a new episodes of Ukrainians React, uh, and they're going to be reacting to Harris's statements on the war. They're going to be reacting to Donald Trump's, they're going to be reacting to J.D. Vance's, and they're going to be reacting to Biden's as well as the policies of the United States up to this point on the war, particularly Joe Biden's. Uh, but we don't really know because she hasn't been in that position to make those decisions. And when she's asked about NATO membership, she says, when we get to it, and she'll say things like, oh, we won't negotiate without Ukraine at the table, but that's already Biden's position. That's been Biden's position. Oh, you know, uh, these, this uh, forcing Ukraine to give up territory for peace, like my, some people have suggested, is, is surrender. It's a stronger statement. But it doesn't say anything about ammunition shipments. It doesn't say anything about aid. It doesn't say anything about, you know, coordinating with South Korea. It doesn't say anything about long-range strikes, which she has answered no questions on. And she doesn't have much foreign policy experience to point to. I mean, she was at the Ukraine Peace Summit. She's had gotten some as vice president, but there's just not a lot to pull from. So it's really anybody's guess. Um, I doubt she's going to be weaker than Biden on the issue, especially since she's going to be a new president and she's going to want to establish herself as credible um, foreign policy wise. She's going to I don't think she's going to just like throw the baby out with a the bathwater or reel back policy. Need a new swear word? Time to join the dark side and embrace the R word. I'll even give you the past DGGL. Thank, thank you for the... <laughs> Thank you for the 25 uh, Polish bucks. Uh, it's PLN, so I believe that's Polish. Um, I appreciate it. I just wanted on the record that it was a poll that asked me to use the R slur, okay? Keep that on the Dylan historical encyclopedia that someone must be keeping. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the money, though. I do appreciate it. But we don't know what Harris is going to do. Now, the hope of many Ukraine supporters is that Harris, new in the office, wanting to prove herself in foreign policy advised likely not by Jake Sullivan and, uh, or Secretary of Defense and, uh, Austin, who are going to be removed, also Blinken, which I don't know if that's the right decision on reference to Ukraine, but probably, now advised by someone like, I think likely, Philip Gordon, um, who, you know, is a, wanted to be more aggressive towards the Russians on Syria. It could be that they go further. It could also be that they just stay the same. That she's going to appoint a bunch of Obama-era uh, foreign policy people, so people from the Obama administration, the Obama administration who did very little back in 2014, which Joe Biden himself blames Barack for, saying it's his effing fault in, a, in the Bob Woodward book. So it's not like, oh, that's not my opinion that Obama was weak on it. That's the current president of the United States and Obama's for, uh, former vice president, Joe Biden's opinion. And if we stay... At this state, going into the next year, are we going to be talking about the Battle of Kramatorsk and Slovyansk, 
which two like a year and a half, two years ago, it would have been crazy to think about talking about those battles as, as something that's possible. Now, of course, those are much bigger cities. Um, but I mean, when you talk about the people in Kramatorsk, and this is this is crazy to think about, there are people who back in 2014 were forced from Donet, uh, forced from uh, Crimea, and then they fled to Donetsk. And then later that year, they fled Donetsk as a refugee again, again, losing whatever they brought there in the violence and the chaos. And then they move to Kramatorsk. And now they're going to be forced out again. That's not even talking about the other people. If, of course, like people in cities that have already been pushed away, like like Avdivka, they have they face the possibility of being made a refugee for the third time in 10 years. Look, we need action yesterday. I hope after the election, we'll have some clear headedness. And now, and you know, as the partisanship totally fades away, we're going to see some action, but I'm, I'm very nervous because the situation is critical. I don't think the administration is making the decisions that's necessary to change it. And I don't believe that the opposition is going to be changing their tune anytime soon. And so right now we're waiting for Father Winter to buzz out the clock, complicate Russian operations, and hoping and praying that if North Koreans in the near future enter into official combat operations start assaulting Ukrainian positions in Kursk, we're going to see a more formal response maybe through the shipping of artillery shells or elsewise. Because again, the biggest thing that Ukraine needs right now is artillery shells. There's artillery shells and ammunition. Everything else can be built on top of that. Air defense systems, drastically, they need that. Armor, they need that too. But if they can get that, then they can stabilize the line and start building the defensive lines. Because the thing is, they need to build the trenches in front of Pokrovsk. And in order to build the trenches in front of Pokrovsk to defend Pokrovsk, they need to hold the line where it is. Because what happens is the Ukrainians take a position, the Russians, they start to, you know, they maybe attempt to build something behind that, or maybe not at all, depending on corruption or whatever. Uh, they start start to build something behind that. The Ukrainians get pushed out of their position. And then, oh, well, okay, construction's not good enough. I mean, we can't do construction here anymore because now this is the front line. And if you continue to do construction there, then you're going to lose the little bit of engineering equipment you do have to FBV and missile strikes. And so then they bring the engineering equipment back. And then repeat the process, repeat the process, repeat the process. And so if they are able to hold the line where it is, even if it's not in front of Pokrovsk, they need to build strong defensive structures in large amounts across the front line and multiple layers of defense because while the Russians have made many mistakes in this war and will probably continue to make many mistakes in this war as, but they're improved, of course they're improving and you should not just call them all idiots and fools for the memes on the Twitter. I remember I saw anonymous account, you know, you know, anonymous, like the hackers, they have a Twitter account and they tweet from it. And there was this tweet where they were like, wow, Ukraine's so cool. They're going to destroy Russia and North Korea's army. And I was like, you dolt. You don't, it's not their job to do that. It's not their job. Ah, you can go look up the tweet yourself. You can go look up the tweet yourself. That that aggravated me. That aggravated me quite a bit. A curd is a curd. Oh, Fraggy. Things do you five. think the ammo situation is so bad because Germany stopped sending ammo? Greetings from Germany. Scholz is not so smart. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, it's not... The Germans do not have a tremendous amount of ammunition to send. Uh, but, I mean, I think the FDP, uh, which is the more liberal, economically conservative uh, faction within the traffic light coalition in Germany, which is made up of the Greens, the Social Democrats, and the FDP, um, them stating that no new funds are allocated to, uh, to Ukraine uh, going to 25 and 26, not only do I think that's not good planning and that's really bad for sustainability, of the Ukrainian armed forces, but I think it's also bad for deterrence because what you're saying is, okay, we'll fight until 2025 and 2026. And now what we have called a national security priority, defending Ukraine to stop the expansions of war in Europe into the 21st century. I think we're re-entering the early twenties. Um, but now it's, now it's expensive. So never mind. It's, it's, 
it's a signal that sends to the Russians like, oh, just push harder, just push harder, push a little bit longer. And that's why, like, if 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 this war was different or if the Western response was different, Russia might not be willing to accept these casualties because if they thought, well, the West is just going to fund this 2028 to 2029 as long as we push it, then they could then they wouldn't be able to sustain these types of casualties because this is not a uh, the attack method that they're using of large scale. Well, not, I mean, small scale and then turning into large scale once they find the weak points, assaults on enemy positions, these come with very high casualty numbers. Doing these charges across open fields and motorcycles and massive mechanized assaults, when they do do the massive mechanized assaults, it comes with high losses. And they wouldn't be able to sustain this for another three, four years. They just don't think the West would be able to last that long. And they don't think that the West is going to get the spine in order to form a defensive wall around Ukraine to make them have to negotiate on Ukraine's terms or on terms at least favorable to Ukraine.